The Fog of Angel Lake To this day I cannot comprehend what had happened in that old, godforsaken town of Angel Lake. The fear and the horror one felt going there was already severe enough, but what my friend and I witnessed and experienced is one I wouldn't dare wish on anyone else. We are still shaken by it. And even hearing the name Angel Lake makes us shudder with regret and loathing of that place. Often I have terrors from the dreaded thing I saw there. None of this had started due to some morbid curiosity or some sort of legend tripping we wanted to take part in. In fact, all of this happened just because my friend and I were curious. I was a student who had an appreciation of anthropology and history while my friend was a passionate lover of folklore and mythology. We both bounced various factoids of knowledge about what we specialized in. We also shared a taste for the macabre, so we often did our own research into darker and mysterious subject matters, such as Roanoke Island's lost colony, or the hideous murders that took place in Hinterkaifeck. One interest we've shared our entire lives was the subject of ghost towns, to us, ghost towns held mysterious and fascinating stories of the past that no textbook could ever capture. What made them even more enticing was that they were often left untouched, so everything was as still and as silent as the day the villagers abandoned it. It is as if the forgotten town was a graveyard for the former life that it used to have. My friend and I also enjoyed speculating the cause for the departing, if indeed we can call it that. Sometimes we've read that there is little to no evidence as to why a town is utterly abandoned. There are the obvious, more logical explanations. Shortage of crops, famine, drought, rebellion, or sometimes simply the desire to move on. However, the ghost town of Angel Lake is notorious for having absolutely no explanation as to why it was abandoned. There are a large number of ghost towns in the world that have been abandoned by their original denizens, but this one had a peculiar history. Very little is actually known about Angel Lake itself. My friend and I searched high and low to discover more about it. Other than a very small number of online articles and one or two history books, the most that's been said about it is that it was established sometime in the 1800s. The town is named after the lake that resides by it, and was mysteriously abandoned in 1936. It's also unknown what truly happened to the people who lived there, because it seems they had just disappeared from history. No one ever figured out what happened to them, or why the people suddenly left. What little we've read detailed the so-called logical possibilities, but it also highlighted the more curious aspects. It's believed that dark occult practices had gone on there for centuries, and that may be the cause for the elusive disappearances and subsequent abandonment. What is known in recorded history was that the area was shunned by the indigenous people of the area. Tales of evil essences dwelling there were frequently recited amongst themselves. Spanish explorers who visited the region also briefly wrote accounts of strange and frightening happenings in the area, so much so that they called the place El Lago de los Diablos, the Lake of Devils. Due to the strange and sometimes horrifying occurrences that happened, they never truly described what had happened and led them to leave it. The Spaniards found it so frightening that they quickly abandoned the place for hundreds of years until it was renamed Angel Lake by English-speaking settlers who learned the name and changed it due to it offending their religious views. Legend has it that numerous witches' sabbaths happened near the area of Angel Lake and that it ultimately led to the people being kidnapped and flown away into the night by gargoyles and winged devils. Others say extraterrestrials came down from the stars and abducted the human populace. Stirred by this strange tale and being lovers of history and folklore, my friend and I decided to travel to Angel Lake to explore it, and perhaps discover why the folks of the place had moved elsewhere. It wasn't too far from our hometown, so it was possible to make it in a few hours. We would end up regretting that decision for the rest of our lives. This foolish decision did not come from just 
the urge to explore. We had planned on taking a few snapshots of old articles and perhaps touring the old decaying buildings. What awaited us is nothing I can truly explain to this day, nor is it something I wish to relive again. I would highly advise someone to steer clear of Angel Lake and let it rot. It's a breeding ground for nightmares and evil, and I wouldn't dare wish this experience on anyone else. During the drive, my friend and I eagerly discussed our theories about Eerie Angel Lake. Being students, we were trained to study and analyze situations with rationality and critical thinking. Naturally, we were willing to take anything with supernatural qualities attributed to it with a grain of salt. Between the two of us, however, my friend was the more superstitious. It wasn't in the sense of him reading and following horoscopes or believing in magical horseshoes or something ridiculous like that. Instead, he seemed to believe that not everything had a truly scientific explanation, and that there were many things in this life that the scientific method alone couldn't explain, no matter how much we wanted to. But after I explained what we had seen... I don't think either of us can truly choose to believe anything rational anymore, whether it's scientific or otherwise. The further we drove on, the more decrepit and strangely lit the place seemed to get. In fact, at one point, I had rolled down the window only to hear nothing but the deathly silence of the area. If any animals were making noises, they were hardly detectable, other than a brief rustling of grass. We had travelled during the late afternoon hours, so that by the time we had arrived at Angel Lake, it would be evening. I can say now that this turned out to be our gravest mistake, along with even daring to travel to this accursed city. We did it for the sake of creating a foreboding and haunting atmosphere. But what an idiotic move. It wasn't until we were close by that we suddenly began to feel the true loneliness and isolation of this town. Miles and miles of road stretched on, and with each mile the road became less maintained, cracked, and cared for. We drove past forgotten valleys and shadowy mountains, and the grass became unkempt and overgrown. Eventually we began to spot unpleasant little ancient run-down cottages here and there scattered around the now dirt roads. Our vehicle romped violently against the bumpy and ragged path. We became excited, as a few of these old cabins appeared authentic and rustic, perhaps dating back to the 19th century. I quickly snapped a few pictures of it with my phone. These must have been folks who decided to have a simple living during the time and not to move into the industrialized portion of Angel Lake. At one point, my friend had no choice but to park the car, and we had to continue our travels on foot, seeing as the path became too difficult to traverse through by driving. The moment we shut the doors of our car, we immediately felt the atmosphere of decay. The trees, plants, and grass appeared gloomy and moist from the rain that had fallen a few days earlier, and any animals we heard around were furtively scurrying or climbing up tall, blank trunks. The ground was very muddy, and we could hear the faint twittering of unknown birds in the distance. Finally, our eyes landed on a small, dark town located at the end of this virgin forest. Originally, I thought we'd be thrilled to explore this age-old town and investigate what had happened to it. But for some reason, both my friend and I felt hesitant to step inside. As outlandish as this sounds, we felt a sort of unwanted presence emanating from it. The more we gazed at it, the more we felt slightly afraid. I did my absolute best to hide it, and I noticed my friend's fears because he was as fretful to enter as I was. He turned to me and asked if I was coming along and what I was waiting for. I lied and made up an excuse that I was simply observing the town. We both exchanged unsettled laughs and went in as if we were both untroubled. The streets were filled with old architecture and desolate houses, there were still signs from the old shops hanging up, and the residential homes still had wooden furniture on the verandas. It felt so strange to be here. 
Often when we walk through neighborhoods, we often expect to see the windows lit up or people walking down the road. But here, it felt so empty and forlorn. It was very unnerving to imagine what had happened to this little place to be forgotten. We knew we could go inside any of these buildings that we liked and rummage through the things they contained. But there was something curious about these houses that left us feeling fearful of them. It was as if there were things still dwelling in there, hiding in the darkness and waiting for someone to enter it. It sounds silly, yes, but it felt that way. The fact that the sun had gone down and the sky was beginning to darken made it seem even more grim and devoid of life. As we marched our way through the dead streets, we snapped more photos and pointed out the little stores and houses we found interesting and remarked on their archaic appearances. I believe that secretly my friend was pointing at places and objects just to fool me into thinking he wasn't afraid, but the truth is, it was so powerful that I could sense it. We were both very afraid, and I believe we both began to regret coming here at this late hour. Regardless, there was something that enticed my curiosity that I simply had to search at. It was an old rectangular building in the town's plaza. The sign on top of it read, Angel Lake Newspaper Agency. I pointed it out and my friend became excited as well. Inside, there would surely be valuable sources of information revealing how life was here, and perhaps shed light on some of the citizens and its history. We both pushed open the decrepit old door and entered into the small office-like place and stared in complete amazement at the old tables, typewriters, and file cabinets that were knocked over and scattered all over the room. We instantly began scavenging through the old papers and furniture, we found numerous unfinished newspaper articles detailing the events going on in the nation, and many tidbits of local news during the 1930s. It was evident by this that the journalists who were writing these must have got up and left suddenly. It left us with a slight unnerved feel as we continued to look through everything. I then ventured inside another room, and I believe this to be the editing room. There were numerous front-page articles taped to the walls and two windows looking out into a large tarn. The tarn was Angel Lake itself, which this town was named after. I got to what I believed to be the newspaper editor's desk. There was a large stack of newspapers on top of it, neatly arranged and untouched. I looked back at my friend and saw that he was just tossing papers around and going through the contents of a desk. It felt amazing for a brief second. I was holding in my hands a newspaper that had been written nearly 80 years ago. It still felt as fresh as the day it was off the press. I read the headline, the year being 1936 according to the paper's date, and I felt a pang of fear churn inside of me. It read, Strange fog spotted in the middle of Angel Lake. As I finished reading those words, my eyes shifted over to the large lake at the window. As I studied it for a moment, the water appeared more shadowy and still than any other lake I'd seen in my life. It had a sort of haunting quietude to it. I then turned my attention back to the newspaper once again and began to read. On October 11th, an unexplained fog was spotted growing in the middle part of Angel Lake. People say it seems to have come from nowhere, and witnesses who live nearby claim to hear strange and frightening noises coming from the lake itself. Unexplainable lights seem to radiate from the core of the fog that is building in the water. Local law enforcement and fishermen have attempted to go out and see what the source of this unexplainable mist is, but they claim there seems to be a horrible odor emitting from it that prevents them from getting closer. They will attempt to explore it at a later date, in which they hope that the terrible scent has subsided. This story had me captivated. As I looked down to read more of the newspaper, I realized that there were more articles of this event. Each article was dated only days later from the one I had just read, and I quickly snatched them all up in chronological order. I was both excited and unsettled by what I had just read. The next article said the following. On October 19th, the fog had nearly covered all of the lake, and was reaching the shore and even extending into the neighboring woodlands. People are beginning to fear that it will enter the town itself, 
It seems that way as it is not receding at all, but has instead grown thicker. Citizens are complaining to the mayor and other elected officials that the awful scent has begun to disturb their everyday lives. Furthermore, people continue to claim that bizarre, multicolored strobe light effects flashing inside the mist are making them feel nervous. In the late hours of the night, they claim to hear discordant, hellish noises coming from the direction of where the fog is approaching. A public announcement has been made that the people should remain indoors until the fog has dispatched. I'm not normally one to get superstitious or frightened by something like this, especially since I knew this could have easily been a case of yellow journalism. But what made me begin to get afraid were the circumstances surrounding this old ghost town. It had become abandoned, and everything was dropped as if something suddenly happened. But what if it wasn't abandoned? What if something horrific happened here? As those thoughts filled my mind, I suddenly looked down at the newspaper I was holding and noticed my hand quivering nervously. I didn't even notice it at first, and I quickly put it down and picked up the next newspaper. This one was dated the 5th of November. The fog has still not disappeared since it was first spotted on October 19th. The city government is still uncertain of what it is and how to get rid of it. The fog has now reached Angel Lake and has begun to crawl its way onto the streets. Denizens are beginning to disappear under mysterious circumstances. People are claiming that a few of their loved ones have gone outside to stare at the mist and, as if under some sort of hypnosis, went into the foggy depths and never came out. The last thing they hear would be their loved ones let out a horrible shriek of terror, and then no trace of them would be left. The bodies of cattle, birds, and various other assorted animals are discovered dead near the deadly mist. Plants and trees are also beginning to decompose, wither away, and die when the fog approaches them. It is unknown what will be done at this time. At this point, my friend entered the editor's office, and I immediately cried out and dropped the newspaper as he called out to me. He noticed my alarming expression and my demeanor, and asked me what the matter was. Trembling, I picked up the newspapers I was holding and read them aloud to him. When I looked back at him, he was just as pale as I was. I could see the fear in his eyes, and he too appeared stricken with dread. I saw him nervously make his way over to the window, press both palms against the window pane, and stare out into the lake. I joined him there at the other window. I noticed that the trees and plants around Angel Lake appeared dead, grotesque, and lifeless. It was then that I realized that that was giving the strange old town such a haunting feeling. Everything appeared barren and without life. The lake itself appeared like a lonesome, cold abyss. The more I peered at it, the more I envisioned unspeakably abominable things hidden beneath it. Was there any validity to these newspaper pieces? Was it just an elaborate hoax? They appeared so authentic. It just didn't make sense. I went back to the desk and picked up the next newspaper. Surprisingly, the newspaper appeared to be the last one that was fully completed. I read it aloud to my friend who had joined me at the desk. Only now he appeared more colorless and nauseated than before. This last article was dated November 14th. The infernal mist has begun to overtake Angel Lake. The authorities have promptly begun evacuations of the town. The fog, although of unknown origin, has been considered dangerous by the town's officials. Crops have become deformed and non-edible. Animals have also grown deformed, dying as their flesh rots away. People of Angel Lake seemingly fall under some sort of inexplicable trance that lures them into the deadly fog and do not return. It is uncertain where they go to, or if they are even alive anymore. The foul odor has been speculated to come from the mist itself, and has become completely unbearable. The fate of our town will be left unknown. I placed that nerve-shattering article back onto the table and arranged the newspapers back the way I found them, and perhaps the way they've been for decades. I suppose I did it out of respect for the original inhabitant who had done it that way. 
My friend and I exchanged very nervous glances at each other. Suddenly, this once scholarly and anthropological journey had turned into an ominous and weird mystery. It left us both vexed and with far more questions than answers. I felt myself grinding my teeth in nervousness. My thoughts were muddled with the perplexing accounts I had just read. My folklorist friend turned back to the window to gaze out into that hellish lake again whilst I began to scan the room for more evidence as to what had happened to this ghost town. As I was searching through the desks and the ground, my eyes suddenly landed on an old typewriter at the corner of the room. It piqued my interest because it seemed to have a half-finished piece of manuscript of sorts wedged in its platen. Not wanting to touch it due to me desiring to leave everything as authentic as possible, I stood over the device and read the hardly legible text smeared on it. To my surprise and horror, it seemed to be a sort of note hastily written up by some unknown typist. It wasn't formally typed to be in the newspaper. I began to read it, and after this I began to truly feel the overwhelming essence of pure horror. The damned fog is not just vapor. It's a living thing. It is not just taking people, it is eating them. The toxic fumes are killing the flora and fauna, it has some sort of devilish power. It is overtaking Angel Lake. I leave this note here to warn anyone who is foolish enough to come here. If you are reading this, get out of Angel Lake now. You absolutely need to. If you wish to stay another moment, may God have mercy on. That was all that was written on the sheet before it abruptly stopped. I just stood there quaking like a miserable coward at the words on the paper. I felt the slightest noise would make me jump at this point, and I was intoxicated with the dread. Then there came this horrible shriek from my friend who was still looking out at the terrible lake. The moment I heard his scream, I stood frozen there with absolute paralyzing fear. I had never felt such a horrible coldness stop every part of my body. Even my breath felt restricted. I heard him calling my name repeatedly and frantically, and the tone in his voice sounded as if he were ready to start sobbing hysterically. I managed to break out of that grip of extreme fear, and I sprinted over to my friend, demanded to know what was wrong. All he did, with a terrified expression on his face, was point his finger towards the lake. Before I even looked, I had the feeling of just wheeling around and running out of this demonic town as fast as possible. With the horror beginning to take a hold of me, I stared out of that window, and I observed the most bizarre and unexplainable phenomenon. I don't think I've ever read or seen footage of something like this. Instead of being fascinated by it, it filled me with a putrid dreading and loathing as I recalled the frightening accounts in the newspaper articles and that final message. It appeared like a milky white fog was beginning to swirl over the tarn's water, but it moved unlike any sort of mist I'd ever seen. It seemed to slither like a giant snake, as if searching for something or some other horrible thing. But what gave this fog a most terrible and bizarre quality was the eerie shifting of colors flashing vehemently inside of it. It was like multicolored lightning, shining furiously inside of a storm cloud. The fog seemed to be crawling towards the shoreline at a rapid pace, as if it were intentionally doing it. I just stared at it, mindlessly and wide-eyed. I couldn't figure out if I was too fascinated or too petrified to move a muscle. All I remember was my friend screaming something at me, and I instinctively whirled around and ran alongside him. Tripping over what I formerly thought were treasures of this old town, I kicked aside old furniture and forcibly shoved open doors. As we ran outside, nightfall had already arrived, but what added even more fear to this already horrible situation was that, in the air, there was a noxious, vomit-inducing odor that I had never smelt before. The scent was enough to make me cough and gasp and my eyes water. I covered my face with my sleeve, but even that wasn't enough to block out the grotesque scent. Behind us, strange strobe-like lights began to flash intensely and somewhat menacingly, 
as if it had located us and had a purpose of catching up to us. This encouraged my friend and I to sprint even faster, and it was near the exit of Angel Lake that we began to hear the strange guttural groaning and nerve-wracking screeching erupting from behind. They sounded like howls, but unlike anything from this earth, the sounds were enough to drive anyone mad if they heard them long enough. Just as we reached the arboreal area and finally managed to exit that witch's town, I dared to turn my head as I continued running for my life. It was there that I spotted the supernatural fog swallowing the entire town, every building from the smallest to the most lofty. I saw the nightmarish vortex of colors twisting and writhing inside of it, and for one terrifying brief second, I thought I saw a horrible, distorted, giant face in that fog, as if it belonged to some sort of enormous humanoid beast, gazing at us with bulgy, unearthly eyes hungrily. Once my friend and I reached his car, we sped out of there, paying no mind to the speed limits. We drove out of there, grave and quiet from our ghoulish encounter with the unknown. We were so disturbed from that experience that we never truly did speak of Angel Lake again. Whenever a common fog rolls in, I find myself growing very afraid. I'm not sure if I'm afraid because it reminds me of the mist from that devilish lake, or because I feel that the one coming in will behave the same way. At night, as I lay there with my mind filled with horrible thoughts, I wonder if the people who inhabited Angel Lake had indeed escaped from that monstrous fog, or if it had eaten them as that mysterious message in the typewriter had said. No one has ever come forward to claim that they had lived in Angel Lake, not even an interview. No one also has ever claimed any lineage from there either. It makes me nervously consider the possibility that perhaps the people had indeed disappeared within that fog and not fled. The thought fills me with terror and paranoia. I know I'll never live that experience down. I can only hope that no one dares disturb that horrible fog of Angel Lake ever again. Dumb Supper by Degrady237 I won't like it. But I don't like nothing we do, so what's the difference? Come on, Odie. You know I don't like being in the dark. Especially when the wind's howling like a bitch out there. Stop your whining, Dollar. I'll tell Pa you a cussing. Odessa lit the first candle when she said it, and the flame lit up Dolly's watery eyes like a kaleidoscope. Dolly had always possessed the gift to cry on command, and only Odessa was sharp enough to see through it. You know that won't work on me. Now stop being a sissy and hand me the other candle. It was her little sister's other gift she needed, not phony hysterics. Dolly pursed her lips together and crossed her arms over her slender chest, gripping her own arms in mock defiance, but Odessa knew she would do whatever she told her to. The two sisters only had each other, and in their destitute Appalachian town, that was something to hold on to. Growing up in West Virginia taught them fast and young to survive and to count on no one but themselves, unless you had a blood relative who had some integrity. Integrity wasn't a trait they saw often in their own home, but they knew of a few stray folks who didn't drink and gamble and pass on trauma with a fist. Their father, John Young Jr., was the one who taught them his often slurred life motto, that if you didn't have someone you could trust with your life, you were liable to get swindled in all kinds of dreadful ways. John was an alcoholic, just like his father and his father before him. He was a man who found it impossible to hold on to the little bit of money he made at the lumber yard, and that was before he got laid off in 1871 for his bad back. His boss said he was rightly sorry to let him go, but truthfully, they had been looking for an excuse to get rid of him anyway. The girls had a well-off aunt who lived in Pennsylvania, and she sent a few dollars to John every month out of pity for her nieces. Their aunt Adeline was newly widowed, and tried to visit the girls as often as possible. Her husband was the brother of Dolly and Odessa's mother, 
but the girls hadn't known much about her until her husband died and started coming around. Dolly liked her, but Odessa thought their aunt seemed bored and sad when she visited. Not an uncommon demeanor for someone who grew up in the rural sprawl of Appalachia, but Odessa thought it was more than common melancholy. Aunt Adlin had just recently visited, and the vigil the girls were fussing over could be credited to the influence of their mysterious aunt. Get your talking out now, Dolly. We have to be completely silent if we want this to work, Odessa said sternly. She took the candle out of Dolly's hand. I want to see if the Robertsons are giving out treats for Halloween, Dolly pouted. You know no one around here sees fit to celebrate. The church won't have it. They put something out for all saints, Dave, or Lucky. But Aunt Adeline said. Aunt Adeline didn't know nothing about our town. When you're rich, you can do as you like, get it? We have to follow the rules. We ain't following Pa's rules now. He said we shouldn't listen to nothing on he says. Just take the money and shut it. Yeah, yeah, I know what Pa says. But he's not here, is he? Aunt from abroad. She knows about the world. We should take advantage of that. Odessa struck the match on the side of her father's old rusty matchbox and held it up between the faces for ambience. To an observer, God willing there weren't any, the room would have shown complete darkness except for two floating white orbs that were their frightened, still childlike faces. Why do you want to get out of here so bad, Odie? Odessa heard real sadness behind the question. Her sister, even though she was younger by three years, didn't offer up genuine emotions very often. Odessa sometimes wondered if she felt anything at all. Her fears, distastes, and peculiarities all seemed put on to Odessa as if Dolly was really a sour old man living in a little girl's body. What kind of question is that? Odessa said, lighting the candle. We do all right, Dolly said quietly. Odessa placed the lit candle on the table between them. Are we ready to go, dumb? Odessa whispered. Huh? Dumb supper. Are we ready to go dumb? Silent. Oh... Dolly was barely holding onto her tears now. What's with you? You're acting like you weren't there with us, bouncing up and down next to Annie going, What's next? What's next? I thought you wanted to do this too. In the candlelight, Odessa could see her sister's face flush pink, and then the tears cascaded down her dirty cheeks, making streaks of clean skin like tiger stripes. Please don't leave me, Odie. I can't stand to be here on my own. Pa don't barely get ever come home no more. And I'll, I'll starve, that's what. If you leave here, I'll starve. Now, how would you like that? Odessa blinked at her sister a few times, letting the words melt into understanding in her brain. Oh, Dolly! Odessa cackled. She couldn't help but laugh a deep belly laugh. She clutched her stomach and doubled over, guffawing and trying to catch her breath. It's not funny! Dolly screamed and stood up. The chair fell over backwards, and they both jumped a little at the hard sound. It's funny because you're so stupid, you know that? I told you I'd take you with me. Odessa stood up, walked to the side of the table, and took her sister in her arms. Dolly was only a few inches shorter than her. She would probably be tall, like everyone said their mother had been. She ran off before they were old enough to remember do you think the man who's supposed to be my soulmate would be so cold-hearted that wouldn't even offer to take my sister away too? That's the whole point, silly. Odessa could feel Dolly's warm tears seeping through the front of her old blouse, but her sobs were getting softer. Shh. Honey said that if we do this dinner right, he will appear, and then he'll marry me and take us away from here. Odessa breathed into Dolly's soft blonde hair. She always smelled good, in that way that babies do. Dolly had never lost that smell, and Odessa breathed it in deeply, savoring the comfort and familiarity. As she held Dolly, she tried picturing him again, but his face was always changing. He was more of a feeling than a physical being. But Aunt Adeline said that was normal. She said Odessa wouldn't know who he was until he walked through the door on Halloween night during dumb supper. She said it was how she found her husband, and how her mother had found hers. 
Adeline Walsh, knee butler from Ireland, or the old country as she fondly called it, was proud of her heritage and would talk excitedly about many alchemist ancestors to anyone she felt she could trust. When Adeline first told the girls about the rituals and spells she had first learned as a girl, she made sure their father was out for the night, which was no obstacle since he was rarely home anymore. She took six slender, cream-colored candles out of her carpet bag, and she set them about the room, one on every windowsill, and one on the wooden dining table. Odessa and Dolly stood in the corner, watching, with eyes round as four dark wells. They were rigid with fear, but all that dispersed when Adlin began the elegant process of lighting each candle, whilst whistling a high-pitched, melancholy tune from Ireland. The fear that had been fluttering around in their stomachs and crawling up their spines quieted down. They walked towards the center of the room involuntarily, as Adeline also moved towards the midpoint to light the sixth candle. What song's that, auntie? Dolly asked with reverence. Tis a Celtic hymn, Adeline said. They all sat down at the table their eyes fixed on Adeline's smiling face. Her smile was tight and glacial. Adeline held a long finger up to her lips. Shh. She lit the candle and the room, already quiet, became heavy with silence. Like a blanket of snow had fallen over the cabin. Dolly pressed her lips together so tight it hurt. Later, she would realize they had bruised. Adeline stood and started setting the table. She put out a tin plate, a spoon, a fork and knife in front of each chair. The fourth empty chair was set backwards, facing away from the table. Adeline's hands moved around like dancing spiders, and suddenly a meager place setting had appeared in front of each of them, plus one extra setting. Odessa eyed the empty seat suspiciously and felt the hairs on her arms and the back of her neck start to wake and reach for the heavens. Adeline took her seat again and pointed at Odessa. Odessa's lips twitched in an effort to question what she meant to do, but Adeline's ice-chip eyes caught hers and answered the question wordlessly. Somehow, Odessa just knew what was expected of her, and so she stood and walked to the old kitchen counter, her feet even clad in her boots, tiptoed silently over the floor. She knew where every creaky floorboard lived and avoided it. She picked up a bowl with a fine silver ladle protruding from the black liquid within it. She knew the ladle must have come from her aunt. She had never seen something so beautiful in her house before. She gripped the bowl with two hands and turned back towards the ceremony. For one biting second, she almost dropped the bowl. It had seemed in a flash of the candlelight that a person had been looking in through the front window. She thought she saw glowing eyes of a color she could not comprehend. The eyes blazed with all the colors and none. It was a violent emptiness. Odessa recovered and walked back towards her aunt and sister. She handed the bowl to Dolly. Her sister took the long shiny handle into her tiny hand and pulled a mound of black pudding out of the bowl. They all stared at the dripping ladle with wonderment, and followed its course as a small amount of its innards were deposited on their three flat plates. Dessert first, Odessa thought. It was just as her aunt had described. Everything must be done backwards. Adeline had told them it would not become clear to them until they saw a demonstration, and here they were witnessing the bizarre supper that seemed like childish fun in the daylight. Now the gelatinous globs of pudding seemed more than ominous. The ladle paused over the last plate, the one that sat in front of nobody. They all stopped breathing as the ladle in Dolly's hand started to dip towards the table. Odessa was afraid she would drop it, but didn't dare say a word. Dolly looked at her aunt, suddenly terrified, but Adeline nodded kindly and Dolly was able to muster the strength to add a small drop of the pudding onto the plate. She brought the ladle back to the bowl quickly and set it down on the table beside her plate. 
They all took a moment to look at the final dark place setting. Odessa noted the spoon, fork, and knife facing the wrong direction, their round and pointed edges facing away from the candle and towards the back of the chair that awaited its occupant. Aunt Adeline, Odessa, and Dolly passed bowls and pitchers in silky silence. They kept their eyes on their plates, not looking at each other or the empty chair. They ate and drank with slow, silent determination. First the pudding, then the decadent bits of rabbit and potato that Adeline had prepared, then the soup and a hunk of fresh bread. All was done without a sound. Without realizing it, Odessa and Dolly had the same thought simultaneously. That was the most wonderful, outrageously expensive meal they had ever had, and yet could not taste it. The empty chair was like a black hole. All senses were focused on the blackness of it. The teeth chewing through the meat and the throat swallowing soup was a formality. A process, and the fear of ruin was all-encompassing. Finally, Adeline spoke. Now, girls, is when the final toast would end the ritual to bring the host. Odessa and Dolly whipped their heads towards their aunt, startled and unreasonably agitated at the sound of a voice. Then, Auntie? Odessa tried. Yes, I've broken it. Now is not the time to bring him. It must be done on Halloween night, or the boundaries of the spirit world will not be thin enough. You must do it alone. It must be you and your sister, for it is the both of you that need something from him. Later, after dishes and bowls and cups had been cleared, washed and dried, Adeline took Odessa out onto the porch steps with her to talk alone. Your sister has something. What do you mean? Without her, it would be nearly impossible for you to conjure your savior. But why? She has the gift. It's nothing to do with me. You know we are of no blood relation, but when I first met you both, even as little children, I could sense it. She must be the one to initiate the final cheers when you repeat the process alone. Make sure your father isn't home. There can be no interruptions, or all is lost. Adeline turned and walked away from the cabin and into the misty woods that surrounded it. Odessa watched her go, and was ashamed of the jealousy she felt burning in her cheeks. This was supposed to be her way out. What did her little sister have to do with it? She would not leave her there, of course, but relying on her to not make a mistake was distressing. All of that came and went a year prior to Odessa turning 16. Now, alone in their cabin with candles lit and darkness shifting around them like ink, Odessa looked at her sister from across the flame and frowned. Could Dolly manage to do this, she thought. Dolly looked back at her with her eyes so big they seemed to expand, pushing out of the features of her face. Odessa was drawn in, could picture her feet standing in the soft pink of Dolly's lower eyelids, as she peered over into the blue abyss and then tipped over, all fears and doubts gone forever. Audi? A voice called from inside of her head. Dolly was talking to her, but not out loud. Odessa tried to say something back, but didn't know if it would work. Dolly's eyes were unchanging. Are you ready, Audi? Odessa nodded. She passed Dolly the basket with a white napkin over it. Dolly lifted the napkin, taking care not to rustle the wicker weaving. Inside were three soul cakes. Dolly had to bite her lip from saying something out loud. Her father had expressly forbid them from celebrating Halloween. For a man with many sins, he feared the church with a passion that went beyond the bounds of irony. Dolly couldn't imagine where Odessa had gotten them, or rather how she could have afforded them. Odessa smiled thinly, but her eyes sparkled with mischief. Dolly thought of the Robinsons and suspected Odessa had gone to ask them for cakes just for her. Odessa hated asking for favors, but she knew how much Dolly loved sweets and how rarely she had opportunities to enjoy them. 
Dolly smiled back at her sister and felt the spastic hand of worry squeeze her heart. Dolly placed a cake on her own plate first, then Odessa's, and finally, the plate in front of a backwards chair. The girls ate in silence. They were meant to keep their eyes down, but Odessa couldn't help but glance up at Dolly repeatedly. She wanted to have faith in her sister, but she was worried. Aunt Adeline told them that the dumb supper ritual was not one that was just celebrated in Ireland. She said she had come to know many ladies of stature in America that had found their true loves through the Halloween spell. Either the soul of a man they would someday meet and fall in love with would appear, or a real, live man would walk through the door, dazed, unsure how he got there. That man would stay for a drink, and love would bloom. Odessa asked if the men who appeared were always good-hearted. She wondered what would happen if your one true love was unkind or selfish, or not what the young lady expected in some way. Would she know right away? Aunt Adeline told them that only a wicked heart could conjure a wicked man, and if the lady's true purpose was to find her soulmate, then her soulmate would appear. She said it was all about intention. At last... The meager stew they had prepared was consumed. The candles were burning low, and all that was left to do was to have the final cheers. Then they would wait. If all went well, they would be on their way to a new life before their father stumbled back in at dawn. Odessa and Dolly looked at each other solemnly. They raised their cups, with each contained a finger of moonshine. Aunt Adeline had pointed them towards their father's stash under the floorboard in his bedroom, before she left. She said alcohol must be sipped for the final cheers to show the spirits that they meant business. The silence pressed in on Odessa's eardrums, and she wished it would just be over. In that moment, she wished they had never started. Without taking their eyes off of each other, they brought the chip ceramic cups to their lips and let the liquid burn down their throats. Their eyes remained locked, and Odessa watched as a tear rolled down Dolly's cheeks. The sputtering candle flame made it look red, like blood. At the time, she believed it to be a result of the strong homemade liquor. As the moonshine lit up their bellies, the candles in the windows, and the sixth candle in the middle of the table sputtered out, one by one. The silence intensified, and Dolly squeezed her eyes shut and started shaking. Odessa stood up, she wanted to call out to her sister, but wasn't sure if they were allowed to speak yet. The tense pressure tightened like a vice, and Odessa gritted her teeth against it and started to panic, feeling real fear that her head would pop. She pictured a fractured pumpkin on the ground, just guts spilling out and around it. Then it stopped. Odessa opened her eyes slowly, and she looked around, but saw nothing but darkness. A loud bang and shattering glass made her scream out loud and she cupped her hands over her mouth. She realized the door had swung open and the glass from the window had exploded inward. Odessa lunged for Dolly's chair and funneled the air until she found her thin arms. Her eyes had adjusted to the darkness somewhat and she could see that her sister still had eyes clenched shut and her hands were over her ears. She was rocking back and forth violently. Dolly, Dolly, are you okay? Dolly's eyes flew open. I'm sorry. She whispered. For what? Odessa said, shaking her sister slightly. Odessa saw movement behind her sister's head. She looked towards the open door and saw a figure standing there. It was the size of a man, but she couldn't make out his features. Odessa gasped. What the hell is all this? The father's voice rang out through the dark cabin. Pa? Odessa said breathlessly. The father shambled in through the door bumping into the armchair and nearly toppling over. He was more drunk than usual. As he got closer, Odessa could smell the liquor on him, and his eyes were so heavy that they nearly closed. What devilry is this? What have you little bitches done? Odessa pulled her sister towards her, intending to step between them, but when she looked down at Dolly's face, she saw a vicious sneer spread across her lips. Dolly? Get away from us! Dolly screeched. The sound was piercing and Odessa saw their father flinch back. Dolly started towards him and he recoiled. Then his shock wore off 
and anger filled him up again. He whipped the back of his hand up and out in an arch and backhanded dolly across her mouth. Blood splattered out onto the wooden floor. Dolly went down and nearly landed on her face, but Odessa caught her, and they crumpled to the ground together. I'll teach you. I'll teach you your place, you nasty little bitch. He spit and started towards them again. Odessa tried to think, tried to make her brain focus on how to protect herself and her sister, but all she could do was stare and shake her head, clutching Dolly in her arms. A hand, long and black with nails like talons, slipped over their father's shoulder like a lover's invite. She saw her father stop and turn his head slowly to look at it. Everything so chaotic moments before slowed down. Their father looked like he was wading through molasses. His mouth was caught in a comic O, and his drunken eyes were now wide open as he looked at the claws grasping his shoulder. The nails sunk in. Their father screamed and everything sped up. A face appeared behind his head. The demon was a head taller than him, and its leathery black wings shot out and banged against the walls of the cabin. The thing had no eyes, just holes with something stirring down deep inside of them. It had no horns, just a head without features. There was no mouth, no nose, just those hungry blank holes. Odessa whimpered as she watched the demon slip a second hand around their father's other shoulder and pull. It snapped his arms back and off like someone tearing into a roast chicken. The sound their father made was like a whistle of a kettle. The veins in his neck jumped out and tried to get away as his face grew redder and redder. Finally, the claws dug into the wrinkled flesh of his face and snapped his neck. Don't be mad, Odie. Odessa lowered her eyes to the sound of the timid voice and saw her sister looking up at her with a sheepish smile on her face. Their father had gone limp, and the demon turned to go, dragging his body behind it. I called it. What? I was afraid, Odie. I didn't want you to leave me, so I thought if we could just be rid of Pa, things would be better. Maybe we can go live without it now. Odessa began to weep. Her mind kept replaying the image of her father's purple veins bulging from his neck as he wheezed and struggled. Then there was that blank face, the empty eye sockets. The sound of enormous wings beating the air could be heard from outside the cabin. Dolly got up and fished the broom out of the closet. She started sweeping up the broken glass, and while the broom raked away the damage, Odessa wrapped her arms around herself and curled up on the floor. Listening to her sister humming the tune, her aunt had taught them. Ghost of Nutty Putty by Shadow Swimmer 77 all Jasper could see of the boy by the narrow beam of his helmet light was a pair of low-cut boots and maybe two inches of ankle. Ben? Jasper asked the protruding feet. He felt a thrill of fear at how very still the young man was. Jasper spent several long moments mentally willing a response before, at last, the boots kicked weakly. Ben was alive, at least for now. Really? observed a voice that Jasper reminded himself was just in his head. It looks like the rock came alive and swallowed him. Sucked him down in one big gulp. Pretty familiar, huh? My name's Jasper. I'm going to get you out. The rescuer spoke to the feet, ignoring the commentary. You're going to fail him, the voice said. I'm sure of that, just like before. That was years ago, John, Jasper mumbled under his breath. You're just a memory. It wasn't my fault. Then why am I still here with you? Chuckled the phantom voice softly before falling silent. Jasper knew it would return. It always did. I'll be back as soon as I can, Ben. Just have to go call for some more help. Try as best you can not to move around. You're likely to just wedge yourself even tighter. Ben's foot waggled gently in what Jasper took as acknowledgement. 
Jasper carefully eased himself backwards through the cramped tunnel, one excruciatingly calculated movement after the next. The walls were far too narrow to turn around, and it would be nothing short of a catastrophe if he got himself trapped too. It took maybe five minutes for Jasper, an experienced cave explorer and rescue worker, to extricate himself back into the main cave from the branch Ben was in. Half a dozen late teen and early twenty-somethings waited for him there, four girls and two boys. Did you find Ben, Mr. Grant? The girl who asked Jasper the question had large eyes, wet with barely unspent tears. Her hands clasped together in front of her so hard they were white. Lizzie, he thought she'd caught herself. Jasper took off his helmet and pulled out a handkerchief, wiping the sweat and dirt from his forehead. Yeah, he's in there all right. Got himself stuck real good. I've got a satellite phone in my truck to call for some folks to get him out. You. He pointed to one of the boys. What's your name? G Greg? He stuttered. Well, Greg, you can come on to the phone once I get you set up. The rest of you wait here and for God's sakes, don't go in that hole after him. Jasper grunted at the collection of heads, nodding in affirmation, then began the move toward the main cave's entrance, stepping carefully to avoid a twisted ankle. Greg followed closely. The entryway tunnel was tall enough for a grown man to stand in, and sloped upwards gently for several dozen meters before turning sharply, the last ten or so feet a straight vertical ascent. Just a bit of light from the low-setting sun shone through the hole above him as Jasper climbed through the rough metal rungs, driven into the stone wall to assist spelunkers with entry and exit. Leaving the cave and heading towards his truck, his eyes passed over the bright yellow sign posted next to the entrance. Danger, it warned. Experienced cavers only. That you lot? Jasper asked Greg. You experienced cavers? No, sir, the young man answered. His head hung sheepishly. Jasper's breath hissed through his teeth. Yeah, didn't think so. No lights or other gear clued me in on that real quick. The lucky was passing by. They don't typically come out here this time of day. Is... is my brother going to be okay? A strong hint of anxiety had entered Greg's voice. Jasper lowered the tailgate of his pickup and began searching through the box in his bed. Ben's fine, he replied, finding the small case he was looking for and unsnapping it. But that's a temporary situation at best. I imagine he's in quite a bit of pain and, depending on how tight he's wedged, likely having some trouble breathing. That's double if he starts panicking. The real trouble is how he's stuck upside down like that. Too long and the blood will start to pool and... How long has he been stuck in there? I, I don't know. A couple of hours maybe. We thought he was playing a joke at first, but... Then we tried to pull him out and we couldn't. We tried calling 911, but no one could get a signal. And then we thought about going for help. We couldn't decide who should go and we didn't want to leave him and... Take a breath, kid. I get it. Then I showed up whilst you were standing around deliberating. Not surprised you couldn't get a cell service. We were a little more than 50 miles from the closest ranger station, and that's about where the tower is. That's why they gave me the sat phone and... Um, Jasper paused, looking up at the ominous collection of clouds that had gathered seemingly since he had first gone to check on Ben. That ain't good. Mr. Grant? Cloud cover that thick means this might not work either. He replied consulting a small notepad in his pocket for the number the station had given him to call. Several long minutes of static on the line confirmed Jasper's fear. Jasper shook his head. Shoot. Okay, look. I hate to leave you all here, but I'm going to have to take my truck over to the ranger station and call for help. If Ben's only been in there a couple hours, like you said, it'll be pretty uncomfortable for him. But it's going to be best to have more professionals out here to make sure we can get him out. Shouldn't take me more than three hours to get a full rescue party out here. Meantime, I'll leave you this phone to see if you can keep getting through and... Aw, oh, damn it. A large raindrop had splashed the back of Jasper's hand as he had been talking. He cast a wary eye up at the clouds. Well, this just keeps getting more complicated. You familiar with the weather around here, Greg? N not really. We're just visiting for spring break. Uh-huh. Well... It don't rain often, but when it does, it rains a whole bunch. The way Ben's situated upside down like that is... Any of you have a vehicle? 
Think you can go try and make it to the station and get some more help? No, sir. We hiked out of here. Just brought some water and energy bars. We... We didn't think we'd be going caving. Just saw the sign and thought it would be fun. Okay. Jasper paused for a moment, biting his lip as he considered the sun becoming more and more obscured by the clouds. A sinking feeling growing in his gut. Don't suppose if I gave one of you my truck that you'd be able to take it and get back out here? I, I don't think so, sir. Not in the dark. Yeah. If something manages to go even worse, I'd hate not to have it. He sighed and thought for another long moment before heavily arriving at the inevitable decision. Reckon it's just up to us, then. Jasper returned to the truck bed, rummaging through boxes and selecting several large bundles of rope. A small mallet, a drill, carabiners, and several small pulleys, piling the gear into Greg's arms. Mr. Grant? Greg's voice cracked slightly, his lower lip trembling. You've done something like this before, right? You'll be able to get Ben out. Sure you'll be okay. I... Jasper hesitated. Well? The phantom voice spoke up. You gonna tell him the truth? The rescuer shook his head to clear it. Yeah, kid. Loads of times. Liar. Jasper stared straight ahead, his hand absently scratching a faded scar that ran the length of his cheek. Loads of times. He repeated, his thoughts going back in time. He'll be okay, John. Jasper spoke to a pair of feet in front of him as he pounded the pitten into the rock wall with small, precise taps. It's all gonna be okay. He thought the trap man said something. It certainly sounded like he was talking to someone anyway, but the dense earth made it difficult to hear. Whatever you're saying, buddy, I can't hear you too well. I wasn't talking to you. John said, his voice a bit clearer. Jasper had been working for the Utah Institutional Trust Lands Administration for almost seven years and rescued more than ten cave climbers in every one of them. Despite that, he didn't think he'd ever see one quite as stuck as John Edwards Jones. The young man and a group of friends had decided the night before Thanksgiving to explore the famous Nutty Putty Cave, and, despite having some experience... John had gotten trapped in a precarious position. The birth canal tunnel he'd been trying to find was narrow enough, but Ed's push, the one John accidentally mistaken for it, was even smaller, only about 10 inches wide and 18 inches high. So narrow, only one person could access John's feet at a time. The tight confines were further exacerbated by the fact that the tunnel bored almost straight down and would make any attempt to pull John out in almost direct opposition to gravity. After some quick deliberations, the rescue party had determined a series of ropes and pulleys would give the team the best chance of success. One of the most experienced rescuers to arrive, Jasper, had volunteered to serve as the primary point man to rig the system. Really? Jasper had thought to himself the first time he set eyes on John. Looks like the rock came alive and swallowed him. Sucked him down in one big gulp. By the time Jasper started installing the rescue equipment, John had already been stuck for about 20 hours. Jasper worked with a will, drilling holes, driving the pittons into carefully selected positions and treading rope. Despite his efforts, the hard rock made the going slow. He'd been at it for several hours when he felt a hand tap his foot. Yeah? He asked, unable to see who was getting his attention. Would you hand back, Jasper? See if you can get this walkie-talkie to where John could talk into it. His wife's here and she's six months pregnant. Wants to talk to her husband before we start to pull him out, just in case. Well, hey, you, Mark? Come on, man, just let me work, I'm almost done. Two minutes. The girl's pretty freaked out. Fine, Jasper sighed. He managed to get his left arm back, hand to his side, and could feel the antenna of the radio when Mark pressed it to his palm. It took a bit of twisting, but Jasper was able to pull the radio past his body. He keyed the mic. Anyone there? Hello? John, baby, is that you? A concerned female voice came through the other end. Uh, no, Mrs. Jones, this is Jasper Grant. I'm with your husband. I understand you want to try and talk to him, but I'd like to keep it short because we're pretty close to getting him ready to pull him out. If everything goes the way it should, and it will, you'll be able to talk to him face to face real soon here. Uh, all right, Mr. Grant. 
I'll be brief. Thank you. Jasper reached the radio forward and tapped John's foot. John, hey, can you still hear me? I've got a radio here and someone wants to talk to you. Who's that? John's muffled voice came through the rock. I've already got people talking to me. They don't want me to leave. Jasper shook his head in exasperation. It's just the blood pooling around your brain, John. When you're wedged upside down, your heart's got to work overtime to keep everything flowing right. That's why we got to get you out of there, buddy. Come on. Say hi to your wife. He keyed the mic again. Emily? Yes, baby, I'm here. The young woman replied, the raw emotion in her voice noticeable even through the radio static. I love you, John said, his words taking on a sluggish quality. We love you too. We we'll see you real soon, okay? Okay. Jasper could tell the man was fading. He brought the radio back to his face. Mrs. Jones are going to have to let you go, but I'll get your husband out real soon, okay? Thank you, Mr. Grant. Mark, you still there? Jasper called back. Yeah, sure am. Okay, head on back. Just want to check this rope around John's ankles one more time. Then I think we're ready to get him out. Those pittens all secure? Jasper rolled his eyes. Come on, man, I've done stuff like this a dozen times in the last 18 months. They're set. The kid's fading, we gotta move. Alright, alright. I've got eight of us back here ready to pull. Hang on to the walkie-talkie, give us the word when ready to start. Will do. Jasper carefully checked the knots he'd tied. Satisfied, he spoke to the trapped man again. I've gotta head back a bit, John. So you have room to slide when we start pulling. But in a minute, you're gonna be out. And I'll be the first one you see. Jasper thought he heard John say something, but couldn't tell what. You hang in there, buddy. Jasper edged himself back about ten feet to a slightly wider part of the tunnel. Okay, Mark, he spoke into the radio. Let's go. In the light of his helmet beam, Jasper could see the rope passing through the carabine near his face go taut as the other rescuers took out the slack and began to pull. He turned his attention to John's feet. Oh, God! John's scream was muffled, but Jasper could still make it out. Hold on! Jasper yelled into the walkie-talkie. Stop pulling! What's going on, John? It hurts. John whimpered. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts. I know, buddy, but we gotta get you out. You ready to go again? John made a soft sound of pain, but didn't say no. Jasper called back to the radio. Mark, go again. Nice and easy now. The rope went taut, and John began to inch upward again with agonizing slowness. Fuck, let go! John shrieked again. Stop again! Jasper called into the radio. John, talk to me, bud. What's up? They're holding me. They don't want me to leave. They want me to stay here. Yeah, that's just those voices in your head, John. Don't you listen to them. A little more and we'll have you out, alright? Keep going, Mark. The rope started to pull again, and it must have been Jasper's imagination, but it seemed as though John didn't immediately start moving, as he had the previous two times. After a few seconds that drug on for a subjective eternity, he did, but the extrication was somehow even slower than before. Jasper could feel sweat pooling at the back of his neck, but whether the form of exertion of installing the pulley system or adrenaline he couldn't begin to say. Almost there, buddy. Almost there. Jasper spoke to himself as much as John. At long last, John was pulled to where Jasper could see past the length of his body to his head. Jasper grinned. How are you, kid? John's face was red and dirty, but smiling. It sucks. I'm upside down. I can't believe I'm upside down. My legs are killing me. Then more softly. I didn't think they'd let me leave. Just the blood in your head, John. Mark, go real easy now. Keep him coming. Jasper reached his hand out towards John's steadily approaching boot. I've got you, buddy. He tensed his fingers, their tips just brushing John's ankle. Then, John stopped moving. A low sound of protest escaped his lips as Jasper fumbled to grasp the man's boot. He saw the rope strain as other rescuers pulled from the tunnel entrance, 
but it was almost like something was striving against their efforts. Jasper watched as, impossibly, John jerked back an inch down the tunnel. In the back of his mind, he heard a metallic snap, then the sound of tearing silk. Something flashed by Jasper's face, raking hard against his cheek, and his head snapped back instinctively, bashing into the tunnel wall. Despite his helmet, everything went black. When Jasper woke up, the tunnel was filled with dust. Jasper? Jasper, what the hell happened? He heard Mark calling through the radio. He shook his head. I don't know. We just about had him out. He was... The dust began to clear as Jasper shined his light down the tunnel, only to reveal John's feet back where they'd started, or possibly even a little deeper than before. He was almost out. Dr. Grant? Greg's voice shook Jasper out of his reverie. Huh? Oh, yeah, kid. Loads of times. Come on, let's get back. Together, the two made their way back to the cave, carrying the equipment. They carefully lowered it down to the makeshift ladder before finally getting to the main cavern. All told, Jasper figured they'd gone maybe only 15 or 20 minutes, but they'd already lost all but the barest last bit of sunlight and the rain had already started to steadily pick up. His helmet light revealed Lizzie and the others waiting for them, clumped together in a miserable-looking huddle. Everything all right, kids? Lizzie's eyes were wide as she approached him. I, I think something's wrong with Ben, Mr. Grant. We tried calling to him, but he didn't say anything back. Nah, he's far enough down, he probably can't hear you, darling. Don't worry, we'll get him out. Jasper smiled at her. Might just take a little while. Jasper began by selecting a solid anchor point in the main cave. He bored out a hole with a battery-powered drill, then using the hammer to pound in a long piton. I'm gonna head down in there and rig a pulley system with a bunch of anchor points. Once I get it all set up, I'll have to stay in there to monitor things, and I'll be on you lot to actually pull him out. You think you can handle that? Yes, sir. Greg nodded, a look of determination on his face. Great, now this rock looks pretty hard, so it might take me a while to get everything all set. You all do your best to stay warm and be ready when I tell you to, okay? The group nodded collectively. All right. With a sigh, Jasper eyed the hole where he figured he would be spending the foreseeable future. No time like the present. At the back of his mind, the phantom voice chuckled softly. Jasper sat in a threadbare easy chair in the living room of his dingy apartment. He hadn't shaved in days and wore nothing under the dirty pink bathrobe wrapped around his thin frame. He held a half-empty bottle of bourbon in one hand and a yellow newspaper clipping in the other. His right cheek was heavily bandaged from where the flying carabiner had split it open. The phone on the small table to his right rang shrilly, and he deliberated a moment between the items he held before setting the clipping down to remove the receiver from the cradle. Hello? Jasper asked into the phone before taking a swig of bourbon. He was unbelievably drunk. Jasper, that you? It's Mark. Jasper blanched through the fear or rage he wasn't quite sure. Fuck you one. Look man, I'm not calling a fight. Just want to check on you. Make sure you're okay. Well, I'm not. Kid's dead. His wife's. Wasn't your fault. Jasper stared down at the bottle. I rigged the system. I rigged it. And it broke. Well, that's well. It's true. But it was the rock, not the system. I picked the fucking rock, Mark! Jasper shouted into the phone. Silence on the other end. It wasn't your fault. Mark repeated. There's nothing you could have done. Thought you wanted to know. They've decided to close Naughty Potty Cave. Put a cement cap on the end to make sure nobody else goes in. Yeah? They ought to fish John out first? No, they... The board decided it's too dangerous. Goodbye, Mark. Jasper sneered. Don't call again. He hung up the phone. Sat there for a moment an ugly feeling clamping his chest. 
He hurled the bourbon bottle against the far wall, where it shattered into a hundred pieces to the floor, the amber liquid staining the light carpet. You know it was your fault, right? John asked from where he stood in the shadowy corner. Jasper nodded miserably. And now they're just going to leave me in that godforsaken cave? That's your fault too. Jasper slid from the chair onto the floor, wrapped in the fetal position. His tears came hard and sudden, and didn't stop until long after he'd fallen asleep. Jasper used his forearm to wipe the sweat from his eyes. He double-checked to ensure the pitten was properly seated before turning his attention back to where Ben's feet still protruded. His stomach was wet from a steady stream of water that had begun running past him down the tunnel towards the trap boy. How you doing down there, Ben? The boy's foot moved gently. Okay, we're almost good here. Just have to get the rope situated. Then one last check and we'll be pulling you out. Jasper looped the rope around the boy's ankles, tying no-slip knots the way he had a thousand times before. Truth is, he could do this with his eyes closed, with his hands tied behind his back. But he never took anything for granted. Not anymore. All right, buddy, I'm going to give your friend some instructions. But then, I'll be back to make sure you get out nice and smooth, okay? He doesn't want me to leave. Ben's voice was a muffled reply. Those voices are just blood stuck pulling in your head, kid. It's... Wait, he? Jasper asked, perplexed. He says his name is John. I think you should take the job. All these memories of pain and your imagined sins... I think I'll help you get over them, Dr. Fiegel said from behind the desk. Jasper turned his head from where he lay on the therapist's couch. I don't know, Doc. I just... I don't know if I'm ready. Jasper, you've been coming to see me for the better part of ten years. Ever since your friend Mark bodily drug you out of your apartment. This is just a roving park job. It's not rescue work, per se. Almost the opposite. You'll be doing preventative action, keeping idiot tourists away from the dangerous sites. Okay, but what if I find one that's stuck? Then you call for help. You call for help and that help will get them out and you'll be a hero and you'll finally be able to put those ghosts to rest. Just one ghost, Doc. It's only John that talks to me. Jasper, we've gone over this and over this. It isn't John. John's dead and ghosts aren't actually real. That's just a figure of speech, a metaphor. Any voice you hear is just your guilty conscience, which, as we've also discussed, is completely unnecessary as by a unanimous perspective. Nothing that happened in Nutty Putty Cave was your fault. Everyone's faith in you is fully restored, except perhaps your own. Do this for a little while and maybe you'll even convince yourself. Right, Doc. Jasper nodded. I know. It wasn't my fault. Liar. John whispered in his ear. Jasper was in position and gave two tugs on the rope, the signal he'd given to Greg, Lizzie, and the others. Here we go, Ben. Nice and easy. He called down to the trap boy. The rope went taut and began sliding through the system of carabiners back towards the cave entrance. The knots tightened around his ankles and Ben's feet slowly, agonizingly, inched closer to where Jasper lay, wedged uncomfortably, ready to grab hold as soon as the boy got close enough. Here we go, buddy, almost there. He doesn't want to let me go. Ben whined. He's not real, kid. That's... it's just the blood in your head. Not real? <laughs> Such a liar. We're gonna get you out. It's gonna be okay. It's not my fault. Is anything you say not a lie? The rope slid. The boy inched closer. It hurts. He's holding me. He doesn't want to let me go. Just the blood. Jasper breathed. Closer and closer Ben's foot came. Jasper stretched out his hand to the utmost, clutching, straining to grab onto the boy's ankle. Just the blood. The tunnel widened just enough that Jasper could glimpse Ben's face past his body. His eyes were closed in a rictus of pain. Arms stretched over his head, his shirt soaked in rainwater, 
almost to the shoulders, and just beyond the boy, grasping his outstretched arms, Jasper could barely make out another figure, one he recognized. John's face was red and dirty, but smiling. Ben's eyes snapped open, rolling in fear. He won't let me go, he whispered. The boy jerked abruptly downward and Jasper heard a metallic snap followed by the sound of tearing silk. Something flew by his face and the tunnel was filled with dust despite the water. Jasper coughed, choking, unable to see anything for several long, terrible moments. Dr. Grant? He heard someone calling frantically from the main cave. Dr. Grant, something happened to the rope! Greg, he thought to himself. Is everything alright, Mr. Grant? Is Ben alright? Lizzie, Jasper thought. As the dust cleared, he looked back down the tunnel towards where Ben had disappeared. All Jasper could see of the boy by the narrow beam of his headlight was a pair of low-cut boots and maybe two inches of ankle. Ben? Jasper asked the protruding feet. He felt a trill of fear at how very still the young man was. Jasper spent several long moments mentally willing a response. And then several more. Everyone Else Saw It by Snickering Haystack Jonathan Lynch's Skype session with his mother was in five minutes. He had to admit he missed her. He hadn't been able to visit his tiny hometown in months. In fact, he missed contact with anyone, seeing as his current city has been under lockdown for three consecutive weeks. Fortunately, and unlike many of his friends, Jonathan was still earning his salary though now he had to work remotely from home. It was far from ideal, but being able to work in his pajamas and a cold beer being only five paces away from his workstation, lockdown certainly wasn't without its perks. Three minutes until the Skype meeting. He just wished he hadn't broken up with his girlfriend last month, about a week before the latest breakout, or rather, that she hadn't broken up with him. He'd been on thin ice for a while, and the last straw fell on her birthday, the day he'd promised to take her to see Hamilton in the city, but had been too hungover to go. After two days of silence, she phoned him and broke off their eleven-month courtship. Before hanging up, she complained about his near-nightly binge drinking, how he'd come home late at night, waking her, scaring her cats, smelling like a brewery. After the initial heartache had faded, Jonathan managed to laugh it off. Same problem I had in my twenties, he thought. Can't blame a guy for wanting to have a good time. Still, being all but confined to his apartment now, it would have been nice to have some company. A minute and a half before he had to Skype his mother. Tonight, he was already half in the back, having pounded a few and chased them with vodka. Sure, it was only a Wednesday, but as long as his reports met their deadline, no one at the office would complain. He'd been warned once about his tardiness, disheveled dress, the occasional inebriated demeanor during work hours. But now he worked from home, so no one would notice or care. Thirty seconds left. His mother had already messaged him twice, asking if he was online. Remembering how even in a Zoom meeting for work, he could sneak a couple of brews, he skipped over to the kitchenette, pulling a cold one from the fridge and pouring it into a ceramic mug. No reason to think it was anything other than a cup of coffee. It's not like he was hiding anything. He just knew how worried his mother would get, her being a health nut, a neat freak and a devoted follower of the latest health scare making the rounds across the cable news networks. 10.15pm Jonathan, are you ready? Jonathan planted himself at his desk his cold mug of lager in his hand, and accepted her request for a Skype call. Within seconds, his mother's pleasant yet withered face manifested in a form of a few hundred grainy pixels on his monitor. Since turning 60, she'd dropped getting her hair dyed bronze amber and had let it go grey, 
which, in truth, looked much better. He smiled and took a swig of beer. The two of them spoke leisurely for about an hour. At 73, Jonathan's father, Melvin, had finally decided to retire from the bank. Jonathan was glad for that, knowing his father hated that job and never seemed to get the recognition or due compensation he deserved. The bank always making him work extra hours, take on duties above his pay grade, and always making excuses for postponing vacation days or promotions promised months before. Jonathan had polished off the contents of the mug within six minutes and started pouring whiskey from a flask off camera to maintain his buzz. His mother never seemed to notice. But then she mentioned something that startled him. Jonathan, I can't see too well. Who's that in the room with you? Jonathan furrowed his brow, a cold feeling working its way up his spine. He was all alone. There wasn't anyone in the apartment with him. He hadn't had any visitors for weeks. Uh, th there's no one here except me, Mom. No, there is someone there. There, standing in the corner to your right. His heart lurched. Jonathan spun around, looking to the edge of the hallway leading to his bedroom. There was no one there. Turning slowly, Jonathan forced a laugh. Mom, I think your eyes are playing tricks on you. It's probably the bad quality of the picture you got. It happens all the time. Computers often mistake certain patterns or objects for human faces. But his mother was apparent. There was someone standing not eight feet behind him, plain as the nose on her face. Just then, Jonathan sensed something. Like steam grazed the back of his neck. He considered looking back again, but... No. It was nothing. Just the power of suggestion. Jonathan couldn't place exactly where the feeling had come from, but the chill up his spine waxed into a small, glowing fever, and his mother's insistence was really starting to piss him off. Okay, look, Ma, it's starting to get late. I have a lot of work to do tomorrow. I'm gonna need to go to bed now, so let's just say goodnight. Visibly strunk, his mother began to backpedal, asking when they could Skype next, telling her son that she loved and was proud of him. It was a conscious effort on Jonathan's part not to roll his eyes. When the session ended, he drained the flask, then drained the mug. His brain was swimming around inside his skull, but his stomach was heavy, and his neck was nettled. His mother had spoiled his good move. It was now 11.15. Jonathan decided he'd retire in 45 minutes. Free now to move around unencumbered, he stumbled his way to the fridge and popped another tall boy, taking a deep drink from the can. On the back of the whiskey, the imported lager from Prague tasted of bean juice. He killed it, then popped a second one. Nursing his beer, he walked over to his eastern exposed windows and peered down at the dark street below. He looked down at the local coffee chain, now shuttered, where hours earlier a mob of anti-vaxxers had congregated protesting the store's policy on masks and their refusal to allow indoor dining. At the time, he had shaken his head, mentally condemning them for their stupidity. Now, alone, staring at the empty sidewalk, he sympathized with them. Maybe illness or even death wouldn't be the worst thing to come from all of this. Forty minutes until midnight, Jonathan wasn't drunk. Definitely not. He was tipsy, sure, but not drunk. But he wasn't sleepy either. Feeling restless, he picked up his phone and toyed with the thought of texting his ex. Then, knowing she would accuse him of drunk texting, perhaps looking for a booty call or a quick blowy, he nixed the idea and slammed the phone down on his desk. He didn't need that shit right now. Instead, he remembered his buddy from college, Dorian Wentworth and he knew it was often up late, being on unemployment and collecting checks. The isolation of that night was nibbling at him, and so he texted his friend, asking for a Zoom meeting. Dorian replied immediately in the affirmative. He was already online, playing World of Warcraft, and could use a break. Thirty minutes until bedtime. They met on Zoom and shot the shit for a good fifteen minutes, talking about everything from their exes to the latest online games to the latest draft decisions for their favorite sports teams. Then, about 17 minutes in, 
Jonathan felt his phone vibrate in his lap. Fingering it was just some junk text, he kept chatting with Dorian. Then he felt another text come through. Not wanting to seem rude, he excused himself and picked up his phone to check. The texts were from Dorian. He looked up at the screen, realizing that Dorian was still talking, talking about nothing. Dorian was blathering on and on and just trying to force any semblance of a casual, natural conversation. Who was he doing that for? When Jonathan checked the text, they read as follows. 11.47pm Dude, who's that in the room with you? 11.48 I'm not fucking kidding, who is that? There's someone right behind you. Feeling that same chill up his back, though the fiery friction of annoyance wasn't far behind, Jonathan looked over his shoulder, then did a full sweep of the room. Nothing. There was no one there. Dorian? Said Jonathan, then shook his head, hearing the drunken slur in his voice. Dorian, can you stop pretending to talk about D&D? Saw your text. There's no one in the apartment with me. Your computer must have some kind of filter on it. Those things always see faces where there isn't one. Oh, okay, said Dorian, fear and trepidation audible in his voice. His bold, cherubic face looked stunned. Okay, no problem. Listen, it's a bit late, so I should be shoving off now. See you later. Before Jonathan could say goodbye, Dorian had left the Zoom meeting. Strange, he thought. Almost instantaneously, Jonathan's phone buzzed across the top of his desk, indicating another text. Jonathan picked up the phone. This time, Dorian had sent a screenshot of their Zoom meeting. The title of the file reading, Who is that? Jonathan saw his own face. His heavy with fatigue and drink, and saw a red circle drawn around the wide space over his shoulder. Again, there was nothing there. Nothing but empty space. The phone then vibrated a final time in his hand. One last text from Dorian. 11.52pm You don't see him? That creepy looking guy right over your shoulder? I'm telling you, he's right on top of you. Get out of there! I'm gonna call the cops. By now, Jonathan was near livid. Even his boy Dorian was pestering him with this phantom. What would otherwise just have been an annoyance was amplified into full-born rage from his booze sloshing around his system. He texted Dorian back. 11.45 p.m. There's no need to call the cops. There's nothing here. Just fuck off. He sent the message, then turned his phone on silent. Five minutes left before midnight. Having a hankering for a nightcap, Jonathan made the mistake of getting to his feet too fast. He regretted it instantly, finding his legs were sticks of butter beneath him and the room was spinning before his eyes. It took a good minute for him to find his equilibrium. Then, able to stand firmly on his own two feet, Jonathan made the wise choice of staggering through the hallway to his bedroom and collapsing onto the mattress. He awoke three hours later. He had to piss something fierce. But that wasn't what woke him. He could feel his 40 AVB blood racing through his veins, his heart punching a hole through his chest. His stomach felt like it was filled with rocks, and his temples. He could feel the familiar heat of an onset headache. A hangover for sure. Nothing to get too worried about. When he got out of bed, the crapulent symptoms seemed to recede, and he felt somewhat better. He then strode his way to the commode. Standing, he let out a long stream of urine into the bowl, the dark piss making a small tearing sound against the porcelain. The smell of his piss then hit his nostrils, causing his stomach to flip. Feeling the familiar rush from his gut to his throat, his gullet filling with saliva, he could no longer kid himself. Kneeling onto the floor, he vomited into the bowl, his puke intermixing with the darkened water. The smell was maddening, 
so he flushed before letting go of another mouthful of regurgitated goo. Panting for a spell, he slowly got to his feet and felt the full force of his self-induced nausea. Before returning to bed to nurse his hangover, he splashed some water on his face, then looked into the mirror above the sink. Then he saw it. The other man. The thing that his mother and Dorian had seen hovering over him. It stood directly behind him, as though it were a second head jutting out from his shoulder. He saw its waxy, sallow skin, its dying, bloodshot eyes, the grotesquely bulbous forehead, a swollen scarlet scab of a nose, and a crooked set of yellow teeth forming a hideous, rictus grin. The face was not just malformed, but disgusting in its humanness. He could not only see, but feel its hot breath bearing down his neck. It felt like his flesh were ablaze. Adrenaline surging inside him, Jonathan dashed out of his apartment, grabbing an overcoat and slippers on the way. Not waiting for the elevator, he ran down the stairwell, three steps at a time. Once outside of the building, but still within the property line of the complex, he fished out a lighter and cigarette from his coat pocket and lit it up. He was panting. The tobacco hit his lungs hard, causing him to cough. He took a smaller drag, which soothed the burn of the back of his gullet, and he started to feel better. What was that in the mirror? It was still dark out, dark and empty. He couldn't go far, not without risking infection, that was. Despite understanding the motives and zest for life demonstrated by the anti-vaxxers, he wasn't about to tempt catching COVID. Not over some spook in the mirror. Well, he probably wouldn't catch anything at this time anyway. But why take a risk? Jonathan was always a bit of a hypochondriac. It couldn't have been real, he then thought. It's just stupid. There's no such thing. Jonathan then began to chuckle a little, laughing at himself for being so childish. There was nothing there in the mirror. Assured that he'd been dreaming, imagining things from the power of suggestion, he crushed his cig and made his way back inside. By the time he slung back into his room, his temples were in full throb of an agonizing migraine. But at least now his stomach was empty, and his blood pressure had gone down to normal. It would be a rough day, but nothing that he hadn't faced before. He'd get all of his work done in time, and would even be able to hack it in a staff Zoom meeting without raising any eyebrows. But before he retired to try and salvage what was left of a good night's rest, he crept back into the bathroom. He couldn't say why, other than that there was some invisible force pulling him back in front of the mirror. Perhaps he just needed to assure himself one last time that it was all in his head. But when he stood there, facing his reflection, it only took a minute before the spectre reappeared. There was no surprise or shock this time, not like a jump scare in the movies. Instead, the apparition just materialized into view, as though re-emerging from beneath a black pool of liquid. Its crooked, hideous grin seemed to taunt him over the other side of the glass. Jonathan had a good look at it, and realized he'd seen it before. He'd seen the same face in his dreams, in his nightmares, in the reflections and shadows that always seemed to follow him, ever since he was six years old. The spectre had always been there, always following him but now was far more palpable, far more powerful. Jonathan knew that the spectre would always be with him, always shadowing him. But in all his terror-filled childhood memories, he'd never seen the spectre hovering this close behind, and he'd never seen its face look so near to his own reflection in the mirror. The Abstract Man By Paces Nation 16 Her sickness appeared inescapable as it demolished her health. My mother's weakness seemed to exacerbate the illness. 
The discomforting fact about her sickness was that the doctors had no ability to determine what was causing it. Slowly and gradually, each day her body began to deteriorate. First her nails began to snap, then her hair began to fall in clumps, and now her skin was peeling uncontrollably. It was as if she were being slipped chemo pills. By this time, our house no longer felt like a home, and was transforming into a hospital. First, she had one caretaker, then two, and now we have five in the house. IV bags are strung out about her room, and medical supplies are scattered around the house. My mother's bed has become the only place she spends her days. In fact, I haven't seen her leave her bed in nearly a week. An inescapable sense of fear slowly invades my family's emotions. My days were spent entirely thinking about my mother and attempting to research what her possible illness was. I usually spent much of my time on the internet researching things. I had a natural thirst for knowledge, and in this case, I decided to research everything I could on the internet. However, I had little luck in discovering possible diseases she may have. I would have spent the entire night on the computer. But something drew my attention elsewhere. As I worked on the computer, my peripherals detected something outside. I shifted my gaze to the window and scanned the area in search of abnormalities. I swiftly recognized a obscure figure standing by a tree in the woods was a lanky, bony, dark figure. There was little light escaping the reaches of our home, but the minuscule amount that did just barely illuminated the area around this figure. Whatever it was, it stood motionless, just intently staring at our home. I felt rather unsafe and rolled open the window. Hey! I exclaimed. However, there was no response. The scrawny figure just remained static, looking directly at me. I felt quite uncomfortable. It was as if he had some agenda or plan, and was standing there just waiting for me to sleep, so he may execute his plan then. Though it was a tough battle, I finally managed to discover rest that night. The next morning, I awoke in surprise after a terrifying dream. The rusted springs in my mattress violently creaked, and dust jumped from my covers as I shut up in bed. It was almost as if I had been suffocated by my covers. I fought through the mess in my bed to the window. After looking outside, there was no longer any signs of the abstract figure. I was filled with relief as my nightmare had been swiftly proven false. The previous evening, I had dreamt of this abstract figure entering our home. While in the house, it was in my mother's room, whispering what sounded nothing far from gibberish. I was eager to discover what I had imagined was invalid. The next day didn't really differ from the recent schedule. Being the summer, I spent the majority of my time outside. I ran through the woods, exploring and venturing my way through the tall oaks. Before I arrived back at home, I noticed a peculiar sight. On the ground lay several strands of hair. This looked somewhat odd, but as I kept rummaging through the leaves, I noticed things only grew increasingly peculiar. Next to the hair lay several teeth. I also found what looked like human flesh. It appeared as if the skin on someone's hand had been peeled from the bone and muscle. Looking similar to a glove, the piece of flesh lay on the ground next to the other body parts. I returned home filled with curiosity. I decided the best way for me to indulge in this interest was to research it. I looked up random body parts in the woods and did not discover much. I continued searching, but like my mother's illness, I found little explanation. However, this would quickly change. I remembered the disturbing tall dark figure standing outside of my house. I decided it couldn't hurt to look it up. 
The results I found were quite unsettling. If what I found on the internet was the same sight I'd noticed outside my home, my family and I were fucked. As I read through the articles, it stated the man was a demonic presence attempting to take a human form. Through several failed attempts, it may shed flesh or other body parts. It explained these were mere rejections of the natural human body, as it recognized its demonic form. It explained, however, it may only take a full human presence after sucking the life out of a current human. Only then will the human's parts accept the demonic form. They called this creature the Abstract Man. By this time, I felt disheartened as soon as I realized the height of this situation. The entity was trying to take the possession of my mother. Sure enough, as I stood from the computer, I gazed out the window and was greeted by the unnerving sight of the Abstract Man. He stood there, almost as if he knew of my newly acquired knowledge. He stared directly at me, now closer than before. His gaze remained unbroken as his face was locked onto me. I couldn't make out any human in his face as he had no eyes, nose, or mouth. The scraggly form was totally devoid of color or definition. Now feeling disturbed, I remained in bed the entire night, worried for when the abstract man would strike. I got up every hour to continuously check on his presence. At 2 a.m. he was closer. At 3 a.m. he crept closer still. At 4 a.m. he was at an unnervingly close distance. At this time I decided I should alert my parents. I woke them up and told them of the man standing outside near our home. My father gripped his shotgun and began to walk outside. My mother laid in her bed deep in slumber. As my father pounded the door open we were both greeted with a surprising sight. Outside, our lawn remained empty of any presence or entity. I felt embarrassed. I thought maybe I was just seeing things. The following day, my father and mother left for the hospital. Unfortunately, her illness only grew worse. I reserved my beliefs on her sickness due to the fact that little would trust such a ridiculous premise. I sat on my computer, attempting to research more on the abstract man and discovered more that filled me with an unsettling feeling. I discovered this figure tried to destroy any information on itself quickly after taking the form of its host. When my mother came from the hospital, I was pleasantly surprised. She appeared to have fully recovered. She walked around the kitchen. Overcome with joy, I rushed to hug my mother. I thought after the disappearance of the abstract man, she would easily be able to return to a healthy state. As I returned to my room, I received a telephone call. When I picked up the telephone, my heart sank. Eerily over the phone, I heard a familiar voice speak, sounding rather weak. My mother spoke. Son, I love you. No matter what happens, I love you. She sounded as if she was fighting for her life. I tried to respond, but I was unable to. As I peered over my shoulder, standing there I saw whatever the thing was that now resembled my mother. When it opened its mouth, I heard a sound revoltingly unlike my mother. It uttered shrieks and stood staring at me, flourishing with hatred. I looked to the door and tried to dart away. This being chased me with an inhuman speed and forced me to halt. It snarled in a nasty voice, but I gripped a nearby kitchen knife. It grabbed my other arm and steadily sped its gaping mouth towards my flesh. It was unsuccessful to bite my limb as I jutted the blade into the creature's neck. It fell to the ground, gurgling on its own blood. It shrieked and struggled on the ground. This disgusting conjunction of flesh changed its voice to my mother's. It screamed. Help me, son. Help. I looked back at the being, unable to be tricked by it. It pulled the knife from its throat and crawled away on all fours. I would have attempted to stop it, 
but it was much too quick for me. As it sped away, it made a horrible croaking noise. It ran, still in the form of my mother. That day, my mother died. I guess there was only room enough for one of her on the planet, and this creature now occupied that spot. The abstract man takes the forms of many, and still roams the world as my mother. I have no clue of his whereabouts, but, as I said, he will do whatever it takes to destroy information about him anywhere. As a caution to those who read this, I would recommend you check outside your window every night. He knows you know, and he will at all costs track you down to get rid of the knowledge. If you ever look out your window and see that tall, standing dark figure, you must pack your bags, throw them in the car, and get the hell out of where you live. If you're lucky, you will have evaded him. If you aren't, well, then be ready to give up your body. Ghosts and the Crossroads by Red Nova Tyrant Do you believe in fate? Well, whether you do or not, it exists. And it does seem to have a will of its own. But it also seems to be a reasonable beast, willing to flex and bend to those who prove themselves worthy of breaking from the default path they were assigned in life. Of course, it is best friends with karma, and together they are merciless and cruel towards those they feel deserves it. Sometimes in life we feel directionless, caught like a bug in water spiraling down the sink. War between nations, a global pandemic, intolerance towards different people. We didn't ask for these things to happen, but the paths that be lead us there. You may be unsatisfied with your life, frustrated or depressed with where you see it leading to. Or perhaps you have no clue at all and are just letting fate take complete control and going along with your environment. Because you feel you have no power over your destiny. Because you're scared to make a mistake and ruin everything. Or maybe you just don't care anymore. But it doesn't have to be this way. Find some pieces of paper grid or white, a black marker, some thread and a needle and some matches. Since this ritual is dealing more with your mind's strength and less with your physical bodies, the symbol must be marked slightly differently. But it is of very simple design, a circle with a cross running through the center. An example has been provided. There are two options to mark the symbol down. The first is to draw the shape on both of your eyelids, as you cannot draw on your eyes safely, and therefore this is the closest you will get between the channel of interpretation and your mind. You may use a mirror to help with this. However, should this be too difficult, or should you be lacking eyelids, possibly after having failed a previous ritual, you must then use your own body's essence. Prick your finger with the threading needle to draw the symbol with your blood on the paper, regardless of how you drew the symbol. The ritual will now recognize you as the participant. On the paper you marked with blood, or just a separate piece of paper if you used your eyelids, write down a goal, an objective, something you want out of life. It has to be something very true and dear to your heart, not what outfit to wear tomorrow, or find five dollars on the sidewalk someday. It has to be a destiny strong enough to sway fate into humoring you with a chance for the duration of the ritual. Once it's done, it's time to prepare the main part of the ritual. On the side of the first paper, begin drawing a square with your black marker. If it's on white paper, the squares must be one inch by one inch and the spaces between them should be a quarter inch wide. If you're using grid paper, each black square should be four units by four units, and the paths between them one unit wide. 
You can do this on many pieces of paper as you wish, but you must only connect them as minimally as possible, with thread and needle on the corners of the pages. You want to keep the paths between the squares as clear as possible, but clear tape is ill-advised should you fall into a certain pitfall during the ritual and need to end it quickly. You can do this ritual at any time of the day or night, but the room must be enclosed, and no other witnesses. You'll learn why shortly. Make sure there's adequate lighting so the white and black stands out from each other easily, and that no part of the paper or papers is or are shrouded in darkness. You'll want as much clear vision as possible. Now, an explanation. There are those who died trying to either trick fate or refuse to accept their destiny. And now, their spirits wander the infinite roads of time, witnessing all the living who follow their own destinies, causing these souls to suffer. Either through seeing people like them trying to cheat their futures, only to fail in the end, or envying those who follow their own roads to a good and bright destiny. What you have created is a replica of the crossroads, where people's paths intertwine and affect each other, whether for better or for worse. To begin the ritual, close your eyes for ten seconds, breathe in and out deeply, and then stare at the first intersection of the white lines you see. Stare there and wait. Soon, the intersections around the one you're staring at will begin to fill in with the ghosts of the crossroads. Do not be alarmed, they won't harm you. Yet. It's a labyrinth, and they are just lost in there as they were in life. However, the longer you stay, the more they will begin to recognize your form as not one of their own. Your mind is now connected to this maze, but it is a necessary connection. One of the spots adjacent to your intersection will appear darker than the others. This is the spirit that will lead you to your future desire. As they once wished for the same thing, or something akin to it. And watching the paths of humanity for eternity, they have learned the way to attain it. Shift your gaze to the intersection with the ghost. It's likely that the ghost will disappear, leaving a brilliant white spot instead and the new intersection will be the darkest. Your task is to follow that dark spot from crossroad to crossroad, until you can stare straight on at the ghost for ten whole seconds. When you are ready to end the ritual, crumple up the piece of paper into a ball, then take it somewhere safe and burn it completely, hence using thread over tape. There are some important notes to be wary of. First, the number of squares you draw determines how long you will have to catch the ghost. You must end your search, either successfully or unsuccessfully. Look away from the maze and destroy it before your time is up. Each square will give you 5 seconds of safety during the search, meaning every 12 squares will give you 1 minute. How many squares you choose to draw is up to you, but more crossroads means more time to chase your guide down. However, this comes at the risk of your own mind becoming too involved with the puzzle. Too obsessed in catching the spectre. If this happens and the time passes by, the ramifications will eat your mind away. Even if it's only a few seconds, it's enough to bring on the rot. You'll be pissed that you couldn't find it, and your brain will think that if only you had a few more seconds, you would have gotten it. It will gnaw at you. Being this close to changing your future only to come up short. The black and white image will flash on the back of your eyelids, unable to escape its glare even in your sleep. You'll redraw the maze or use the old one and scan it again and again and again, with no chance of succeeding. You'll walk away from it time and again, only to return and try once more, knowing that this will be the one, this will be the attempt that makes it. But fate's good fortune has fled from you, just like the elusive black spot on the intersection. Soon your obsession will overtake you, until your form begins to wilt away from lack of self-care. Food will not satiate the hunger to catch the ghost. Drink will not quench the thirst for a better tomorrow. Your skin will stretch across your ribs and shrink itself in the shape of your skull, sunken cheeks and all. 
but it will not matter to you. Only that black dot will fix things, and once you find it, you'll never have to worry about your future ever again. So for that, you'll accept the supposedly temporary price of pain and madness, with the final attempt ending in your sticky, rotting skin becoming one with the maze of your own design. Second, if you try to be clever and cheat fate, it will know. You cannot do this ritual in someone else's place if they are too scared to do so. It is your own will, and you must sway your own fate. Only drawing four squares to create one crossroads will not work out well for you, along with any other method of cheating. Words will begin scrawling themselves across the paper, and you'll be forced to read them. These words will describe events that have either faded from your memory or have yet to happen. Horrible, heart-wrenching descriptions of lies, betrayals and sins that you and the people around you have done and will do. Fate will tell you of every horrific moment of your life, and it will make sure that this is the only path you will ever be able to take. Third, if anyone else tries to help you hunt the ghost, it will become completely impossible to find. Even if you coordinate your efforts, not only can the wills of separate people confuse the ghost you're looking for, it will make them begin to shift far more rapidly. And if fate's feeling particularly cruel that day, expect to both be punished as shown in the last note. Fourth, if all the roads begin to turn black, then stay where you are until only the intersections show any shade. Once the roads are clear, you can continue onwards. If they continue to blacken, immediately look away and destroy the maze. Don't look at the paper if you can try, for its entire exterior will have turned into a shade of a starless dark night. This means the ghosts have fully recognized your presence and want to tear your mind out and put it in the maze to replace themselves, so that they can get a second chance at living a life with a better destiny than the one that fate has punished them with. And finally, if all of the intersections suddenly turn as white as the one you're staring at, well then, the ritual is no longer of use to you, since all of humanity is about to meet the same fate. If you do succeed in capturing your ghost, though, close your eyes and focus on the image of the maze you just had, until the words you wrote on the first paper appear in your mind. You can then end the ritual. After destroying the maze, you'll suddenly feel refreshed with a sense of purpose. Your goal will be clear as day, and you may even have an idea or two on how to start walking the road to where you want to be. When opportunities arise that can further advance your goal, you'll get a feeling in the gut that tells you the action to take. It's not easy to describe, but you'll know when you feel it. However, sometimes you may question the actions fate makes you take. You might not even appreciate the future you picked out for yourself. If this is ever the case, and fate senses your displeasure, you'll be punished for your lack of appreciation for the sacrifices that had to be made. And one by one, you'll watch the pieces that hold your current life together, reducing you to a destiny that is most undesirable. So show some thanks, and stick to what you wanted in the first place. You already changed your future once. There are no take-backs. I am Basil Elton, keeper of the North Point Light that my father and grandfather kept before me. Far from the shore stands the Grey Lighthouse, above sunken slimy rocks that are seen when the tide is low, but unseen when the tide is high. Past that beacon for a century have swept the majestic barks of the Seven Seas. In the days of my grandfather there were many, in the days of my father not so many. And now there were so few that I sometimes feel strangely alone, as though I were the last man on our planet. From far shores came those white-sailed argosies of old. From far eastern shores would warm suns shine, and sweet odors linger about strange gardens and gay temples. 
The old captains of the sea came often to my grandfather and told him of things which, in turn, he told to my father. And my father told to me in the long autumn evenings when the wind howled eerily from the east. And I have read more of these things, and of many things besides, in the books men gave me when I was young and filled with wonder. But more wonder than the lore of old men, and the lore of books is the secret lore of ocean. Blue, green, grey, white or black, smooth, ruffled, or mountainous, that ocean is not silent. All my days I have watched it, and listened to it, and I know it well. At first it told to me only the plain little tales of calm beaches and near ports. But with the years it grew more friendly and spoke of other things. Of things more strange and more distant in space and time. Sometimes at twilight, the grey vapours of the horizon have parted to grant me glimpses of the ways beyond. And sometimes at night, the deep waters of the sea have grown clear and phosphorescent to grant me glimpses of the ways beneath. And these glimpses have been as often as the ways that were, and the ways that might be, as of the ways that are. For ocean is more ancient than the mountains, and freighted with the memories and the dreams of time. Out of the south it was that the white ship used to come when the moon was full and high in the heavens. Out of the south it would glide very smoothly, and silently over the sea. And whether the sea was rough or calm, and whether the wind was friendly or adverse, it would always glide smoothly and silently, its sails distant, and its long, strange tears of oars moving rhythmically. One night I espied upon the deck a man, bearded and robed, and he seemed to beckon me to embark for a far unknown shore. Many times afterwards I saw him under the full moon, and never did he beckon me. Very brightly did the moon shine on that night, I answered the call, and I walked out over the waters to the white ship on a bridge of moonbeams. The man who had beckoned now spoke a welcome to me in a soft language I seemed to know well, and the hours were filled with soft songs of the oarsmen as we glided away into the mysterious south golden with the glow of that full, mellow moon. And when the day dawned, rosy and effulgent, I beheld the green shore of far lands, bright and beautiful, and to me unknown. Up from the sea rose lordly terraces of verdure, tree-studded, and showing here and there the gleaming white roots and colonnades of strange temples. As we drew nearer the green shore, the bearded man told me of that land, the land of Tsar, where dwell all the dreams and thoughts of beauty that come to men once and then are forgotten. And when I looked upon the terraces again, I saw that what he said was true, for among the sights before me were many things I had once seen through the mists beyond the horizon and in the phosphorescent depths of ocean. There too were forms and fantasies more splendid than any I had ever known. The visions of young poets who died in want before the world could learn of what they had seen and dreamed. But we did not set foot upon the sloping meadows of Tsar, for it is told that he who treads them may never more return to his native shore. As the white ship sailed silently away from the temple terraces of Tsar, we beheld on the distant horizon ahead the spires of a mighty city, and the bearded man said to me, This is Thalarian, the city of a thousand wonders, wherein resides all those mysteries that man has striven in vain to fathom. And I looked again, at closer range, and saw that the city was greater than any city I had known or dreamed before. Into the sky the spires of its temples reached, so that no man might behold their peaks, and far back beyond the horizon stretched the grim, grey walls, over which one might spy only a few roofs, weird and ominous, yet adorned with rich friezes and alluring sculptures. 
I yearned mightily to enter this fascinating yet repellent city, and besought the bearded man to land me at the stone pier by the huge cavern gate, Akario. But he gently denied my wish, saying, In Tethelarian, the city of thousand wonders, many have passed but none returned. Therein walk only demons and mad things that are no longer men, and the streets are white with the unburied bones of those who have looked upon the Adolin Lathi that reigns over the city. So the white ship sailed on past the walls of Thalarion, and followed for many days a southward flying bird, whose glossy plumage matched the sky out of which it had appeared. Then we came to the pleasant coast, gay with blossoms of every hue, where as far inland as we could see basked lovely groves and radiant arbors beneath the meridian sun. From bowers beyond our view came bursts of song and snatched of lyric harmony, interspersed with faint laughter so delicious that I urged the rowers onward in my eagerness to reach the scene. And the bearded man spoke no word, but watched me as we approached the lily-lined shore. Suddenly a wind blowing from over the flowery meadows and leafy woods brought a scent at which I trembled. The wind grew stronger, and the air was filled with the lethal, charnel odor of plague-stricken towns and uncovered cemeteries. And as we sailed madly away from that damnable coast, the bearded man spoke at last, saying, Thus is Zura, the land of pleasures unattained. So once more the white ship followed the bird of heaven, over warm, blessed seas fanned by caressing, aromatic breezes. Day after day and night after night did we sail, and when the moon was full, we would listen to the soft songs of the oarsmen. Sweet as on that distant night when we sailed away from my far native land. And it was by moonlight that we anchored at the last harbor of Sonanil which is guarded by twin headlands of crystals that rise from the sea and meet in a resplendent arch. This is the land of fancy, and we walk to the verdant shore upon a golden bridge of moonbeams. In the land of Sonanil, there is neither time nor space, neither suffering nor death. And there I dwelt for many aeons. Green are the groves and pastures, bright and fragrant are the flowers. Blue and musical the streams, clear and cool the fountains, and stately and gorgeous the temples, castles and cities of Sonanil. Of that land there is no bound, for beyond each vista of beauty rises another more beautiful. Over the countryside and amidst the splendor of cities can move at will the happy folk of whom all are gifted with unmarred grace and unalloyed happiness. For the eons that I dwelt there, I wandered blissfully through the gardens where quaint pagodas peep from pleasing clumps of bushes, and where the white walks are bordered with delicate blossoms. I climbed gentle hills from whose summits I could see entrancing panoramas of loveliness, with steepled towns nestling in verdant valleys, and with the golden domes of gigantic cities glittering on the infinitely distant horizon. And I viewed by moonlight the sparkling sea, the crystal headlands, and the placid harbor wherein anchored the white ship. It was against the full moon one night in the immemorial year of Tharp that I saw outlined the beckoning form of the celestial bird, and felt the first stirring of unrest. Then I spoke with the bearded man and told him of my new yearnings to depart from remote Cthulhu, which no man hath seen, but which believe to lie beyond the basalt pillars of the West. It is a land of hope, and in it shine the perfect ideals of all that we know elsewhere, or at least so men relate. But the bearded man said to me, But where are those perilous seas wherein, say, Cthulhu lies? In soon and ill, there's no pain or death. But who can tell what lies beyond the basalt pillars of the West? Nathless, at the next full moon, I boarded the white ship, and with the reluctant bearded man left the happy harbor for untraveled seas. And the bird of heaven flew before, 
and led us toward the basalt pillars of the west. But this time the oarsmen sang no songs under the full moon. In my mind I would often picture the unknown land of Cathuria, with its splendid groves and palaces, and would wonder what new delights there awaited me. Cathuria, I would say to myself, is the abode of the gods and the land of unnumbered cities of gold. Its forests are of aloe and sandalwood, even as the fragrant groves of Camarin, and among the trees flutter gay birds sweet with song. On the green and flowery mountains of Cathuria stand temples of pink marble, rich with carven and painted glories, and having in their courtyards cool fountains of silver, where purr with ravishing music the scented waters that come from the grotto-born river Narg. And the cities of Cathuria are cinctured with golden walls, and their pavements are also that of gold. In the gardens of these cities are strange orchids and perfumed lakes, whose beds are of coral and amber. At night the streets and the gardens are lit with gay lanthorns, fashioned from three-colored shell of a tortoise. And here resound the soft notes of the singer and lutenist, and the houses of all the cities of Cathuria are palaces, each built over a fragrant canal bearing the waters of the sacred Nark. Of marble and porphyry are the houses, and roofed with glittering gold that reflects the rays of the sun and enhances the splendor of the cities as blissful gods view them from the distant peaks. First of all is the palace of the great monarch Dorib, whom some say to be a demigod, and others a god. High is the palace of Dorib, and many are the turrets of marbled upon its walls, in its wide halls many multitudes assemble, and here hang the trophies of the ages, and the roof is pure gold, set upon tall pillars of ruby and azure, and having such carven figures of gods and heroes that he who looks upon those heights seems to gaze upon the living Olympus. And the floor of the palace is of glass, under which flow the cunningly lighted waters of the Nark gay with gaudy fish not known beyond the bounds of the lovely Cathuria. Thus I would speak to myself of Cathuria. But ever would the bearded man warn me to turn back to the happy shore of Sonanil. For Sonanil is known of men, while none hath ever beheld Cathuria. And on the thirty-first day that we followed the bird, we beheld the basalt pillars of the west. Shrouded in mist they were, so that no man might peer beyond them or see their summits, which indeed some say reach even to the heavens. And the bearded man again implored me to turn back, but I heeded him not. For from the mists beyond the basalt pillars I fancied there came the notes of singers and lutenists, sweeter than the sweetest songs of Son and Hill, and sounding mine own praises, the praises of me who had voyaged far beyond the full moon and dwelt in the land of fancy. So to the sound of melody the white ship sailed into the mist betwixt the basalt pillars of the west. And when the music ceased and the mist lifted, we beheld not the land of Cathuria, but a swift rushing, resistless sea, over which our helpless bark was borne towards some unknown goal. Soon to our ears came the distant thundering of falling waters, and to our eyes appeared on the far horizon ahead the titanic spray of a monstrous cataract, wherein the oceans of the world dropped down to the abyssal nothingness. Then did the bearded man say to me, with tears on his cheek, We have rejected the beautiful land of Sonanel, which we may never behold again. The gods are greater than man, and they have conquered. And I closed my eyes before the crash that I knew would come, shutting out the sight of the celestial bird which flapped its mocking blue wings over the brink of the torrent. Out of that crash came darkness, and I heard the shrieking of men and of things that were not men. From the east temptuous winds arose and chilled me as I crouched on the slab of damp stone which had arisen beneath my feet. Then as I heard another crash, I opened my eyes and beheld myself upon the platform of that lighthouse, 
when Sid sailed so many aeons ago. In the darkness below there loomed the vast blurred outlines of a vessel breaking up on the cruel rocks, and as I glanced over the waste, I saw that the light had failed for the first time since my grandfather had assumed its care, and in the later watches of the night, when I went within the tower, I saw on the wall a calendar which still remained as when I had left at the hour I sailed away. With the dawn, I descended the tower and looked for the wreckage upon the rocks. But what I found was only this. A strange dead bird, whose hue was of an azure sky, and a single shattered spar, of a whiteness greater than that of wave tips or of the mountain snow. And thereafter the ocean told me its secrets no more. And though many times since, as the moon shone full and high in the heavens, the white ship from the south came never again.